I want to start this talk by asking everyone here a question: How much would I have to pay you for you to not use the internet for one single day? A hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars, or the infamous? It depends. How dependent are you on this technology? I mean, personally, I'd probably do it for a hundred dollars because I'm petty. But as a six-year-old me, and I'd probably do it for free. Heck, I got my first phone when I was grade six. So when did we begin to rely so much on this technology? In the 2000s, we know that the internet has revolutionized almost all industries: communication, entertainment, work, and so on. But one thing that I want to highlight that the internet has revolutionized is the classroom. But that is not my main point. We know how the internet has shown many improvements in such a short amount of time for industries. But now I believe that we are at dawn of another revolution: artificial intelligence. I think almost all of us here has heard about the overpowered language model made by OpenAI. To mimic human language and intelligence, if you may. I mean, I couldn't agree less with how overpowered this is. I mean, look at what it can be able to achieve. This is very intimidating for me at the start. Question yourself: Could you be able to achieve everything that this machine has been able to? Probably not. Which led me to think: Why do I bother going to school when this machine can do the things I need few years to learn in? Why do I bother going to school to learn facts, pass tests, or is it to learn how to think for ourselves, to be creative, to be more critical thinkers, to be more ready for the real world? You know, most education systems right now is mostly revolving around theory, theory, and more theory, and many graduated students don't actually know how to apply these things they learned. As Albert Einstein once said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. Who here just wishes school to end earlier, or better, who here feels stress because of school because they just can't keep up? I have to confess, I am one of them. As Simon Sinek once said, working hard for something that we don't care about is called stress, and working hard for something that we love is called passion. Schools shouldn't cause stress. It's ironic. Schools should be a place where we pursue our interests, where we pursue our love for a certain topic, for a certain field, where we meet people with the same burning passion, with that same purpose as us. And there shouldn't be stress in that whole progress, learning progress. At least not to the point that we'll view school negatively as a whole. However, the traditional classroom sort of incentivizes this. Sort of motivates this, if you will. Think about it. The traditional classroom is like a one-size-fits-all T-shirt. You know, the kind your mom bought you when you're eight years old, and you're expected to wear it in your sweet seventeen party. I know this analogy seems absurd, but it is absurd. The traditional classroom just doesn't fit everyone's needs. In fact, according to a survey by Gallup. Only 32% of students feel engaged in traditional classroom settings, while 70% of students feel engaged in project-based settings. So let me tell to you about my personal story. So I went to junior high school under the national curriculum, and I had to take 13 different subjects, interested and not interested. It was mandatory. In some classes, I just felt like I was staring blankly at the whiteboard, and the whiteboard staring blankly at me. I didn't know why I was there, and I questioned why I was there. I didn't know the purpose. I mean, it doesn't align to my line of interest. It was boring. I was bored. I was disengaged, which moves me on to my next point: boredom. To talk more about boredom, let's talk about human behavior. So why do people feel bored in classes? Right, that's the big question. Emotional intelligence and Yale Child Study Center found that 75% of students have negative thoughts about school. That's crazy. I mean, we used to fight for our rights to go to school. Even now, we still do. So what went wrong here? Where did it all go wrong? 
The report scaling supported the findings with 69.5% of students feeling bored. So why do people feel bored? That's what we want to know. Scott Ballin suggests that there are two reasons, two scenarios of why boredom exists in classrooms. So for the first scenario, I know all this already. Why would I bother listening at all? Just let me go home and sleep. The second scenario, the more often one, the one that I've been experiencing for years, and I believe all of us has. I have no idea what you're talking about, and I have no idea when I'm going to even use them. Why am I here? That is crazy. If we know that we all actually have an innate thirst for knowledge, have you ever thought that deep down we're curious beings? I mean, think back. When we're infants, we try everything. Being nagged at is not even a priority. You just think about it when it comes to you. As long as it fulfills your curiosity, you'll do anything. For instance, you experiment. What happens when you put a battery inside a radio? Or what happens when you put a card inside your car window? That explains why kids are just so hard to deal with. Now, to take, make things more intuitive, I brought a graph, and here's how it goes. So, we know that if our familiarity with a topic is small, the pleasure we get from learning the topic is also small, because the pace the class is ran and the pace we obtain information is just different. We feel like we're learning nothing new, we feel like we're being unproductive. If our familiarity with a topic is big, our pleasure of learning the topic is also small, because we feel we're learning nothing new. I mean, we know all this already. The optimal learning pace is when the familiarity is in the middle, not too advanced and not too basic. However, we must note that every student has different capabilities, different interests, and different familiarities with a topic. But why is the familiarity in the middle is very intriguing. I mean, you know that sense of accomplishment that you achieve when you learn something new? That sense of accomplishment when you finally find your passport. Where is it? When you finally won against an argument against your mother. Well, if you're Asian, it probably never happened, but you get what I mean. Now, as Albert Einstein once said, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Now, we know that every student has different capabilities, different interests, different familiarities with a topic. This means that we need more personalization. As technology advanced, so did our ability to personalize education. The introduction of radio and television has allowed educational content to be streamed at in remote communities. And as we see the emergence of internet and computers, we saw the emergence of online and distance learning. Now, with the power of AI, we can take personalization to the next level. AI systems can actually analyze students' data on learning progress and give them instructions in real time, instantly. People can actually learn the things that they're interested in. For instance, learning how to program in C++ or how to even get a girlfriend. Well, that didn't happen for me, but... This means that every student has different capability, that every student can learn in their own pace, in their own way, and in the things that they're interested in. Now, to give you a real-life example, in 2018, Carnegie Mellon University of Computer Science launched an AI language tutoring system. This system is called LearnLets. The best part, it is able to adapt to each student's unique pace and style, giving them with personalized feedback to make them even better language experts. This AI tutor has achieved resounding success, where students who learn from this AI tutor for 15 hours has achieved significant improvements in their language skills compared to those who didn't. But what does this mean for the future of education? Will AI completely replace teachers? will lead to a loss of human interaction in the classroom. These are questions we need to address as we move on with the integration of AI in education. So what do we think about when you think of AI in the classroom? We might think about robots, right? 
robots teaching children and grading their work. No. Here's why. AI is already used in education in some capacity. Believe it or not, some schools are using AI tutors in specific subjects. Some universities also use AI to grade students' work and provide them with feedback. And did you know that the current e-learning market size is $165 billion dollars, and is projected to reach $325 billion dollars in 2025, which is two years from now? This shows the increasing demand for personalized education and the integration of AI in education. However, we must note that many schools still view AI as having a negative impact on students. I mean, ChatGPT can solve engineering questions, be your lawyer, be a coder in Amazon, be a coder in Google. What stops it from doing your homework? This proves that students can have increasing levels of laziness, decreasing levels of originality, creativity, and critical thinking. We could see that some schools ban ChatGPT, namely public schools in New York City, Maryland, France's top universities, and so on. So I asked ChatGPT itself of its thoughts. However, with all due seriousness, we must note that AI is never meant to replace teachers. Here's why. First, AI is not capable of empathy. AI is not capable of feeling emotions in the same way humans are. I mean, teachers are mentors and counselors. They can provide emotional support and guidance for students. They can give you a hug or a pat in the back, which can make all the difference for a student. In a generation of millennials, in a generation of us, where everything is instant, where we can get almost everything we want, we need someone who truly understands our failures, who truly understands us. Ask many millennials these days, and they think that their relationships are superficial. Yes, no matter how absurd that sounds, superficial. But are interactions with chatbots, with AI, really superficial? We know deep in our hearts, they are. There is nothing like human interaction. We are called social animals for a reason. AI is a machine. It cannot provide us with this emotional connection. Second, AI is not capable of creativity. I know, that is very debatable. I mean, this issue has been debated for 170 years. However, as a free society, I opinionize that AI cannot have creativity, independent thought, or critical thinking in the same way humans are. Sure, AI can analyze data on the data that we fed on, but I believe that there is no originality in that. Teachers are not just transmitters of information, they're also creators of knowledge. They know how to engage students in classes. They know how to make the subject more interesting, to have that emotional connection, to make it feel more humane. AI cannot do this. Another concern that we have is the loss of human interaction in the classroom. But it's important to note that human interaction is never meant to be replaced with AI. It's meant to supplement them. Teachers so that teachers can communicate with students in a more meaningful way. AI can remove all the rigorous, all the repetitive work for teachers. Ask yourself, wouldn't you want to be part of this revolutionary change in education? We should embrace it rather than fear it. There's a funny thing that I haven't told you, by the way, in this whole talk. This whole talk was written with ChatGPT. Yes. No, I'm kidding. My name is James M. Hansel, and I'm a grade 11 student in Stenar Master Academy. Thank you. Thank you.